Officially opened on the 4th of September 1967, the Mirandi Bridge, or to use its official title, the Pulcivera Viaduct, was a marvel of modern engineering and a showpiece of 60s Italian design and innovation. With an estimated lifespan of at least 50 years, the Mirandi Bridge only just made it to the half-century mark. At 11.36 on the morning of the 14th of August 2018, a 210-metre section of the bridge collapsed, sending cars and lorries plummeting 45 metres to the ground below. 43 people were killed. Feelings of shock and dismay soon gave way to anger, as it was revealed that far from being an unexpected event, there were many people who had been warning about this bridge collapsing for years. The 1960s looked to have been a good decade to have been an Italian. The gloomy post-World War II era seemed to be finally over, Italian design was renowned around the world, standards of living were rising, and many ordinary Italians were able to buy their first cars. Of course, more cars meant new roads and new infrastructure, and nowhere was the need more pressing than Genoa, where the two halves of the city were separated by the Pulcivera Valley. A tender was put out for a new bridge which would connect the two sides of the city and link the busy A7 and A10 highways. The winning entry was a bridge designed by Italian engineer Riccardo Morandi. Already known for his innovative use of pre-stressed concrete, his bridge design used much more concrete and therefore less steel than other designs. As steel was in somewhat short supply in the early 1960s Italy due to post-war sanctions, his design was an attractive and economical proposition. Construction took place between 1963 and 1967, being officially opened on the 4th of September 1967 by the then President Giuseppe Saragat. The bridge consisted of a long section of elevated roadway supported by inverted concrete trestles, and a bridge section with longer spans to cross the valley bottom, which was crowded with industrial warehouses, cheap housing, railway lines, and the river itself. It was these bridge sections, sections 9, 10, and 11 of the Pulcivera Viaduct, that were to prove the most difficult to design and to maintain. To support the longer spans, Mirandi opted for a kind of mash-up brutalist design, using some cantilevering from the concrete trestles below, and from above, cable stays attached to the 90-metre towers to hold up the carriageways in the middle. Now, it was these cable stays which were the most revolutionary aspect of Mirandi's design, as he would use bunches of steel cables cast inside a pre-stressed concrete sleeve. The Italian media gushed over the new bridge, with La Stampa newspaper declaring, The bridge won't need any maintenance, neither will its stayed cables, which are protected from atmospheric agents by their concrete vest. One engineering website that I looked at described the stays like this. The concrete stays consisted of pre-stressing tendons cast into a beam of thick concrete for corrosion protection. The stays are then post-tensioned so that they remain in compression. Now, not being an engineer myself, that sentence doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. However, a couple of things stand out about this design, even to an uneducated layman like myself. Firstly, the cables are all bunched together into just one stay. So if this stay fails, there's no backup, there's no failsafe. And secondly, all the cables are hidden inside the concrete sleeve, so there's no way to visually check the amount of corrosion on the steel cables inside. Now, concrete's obviously a very strong and stable material in the right location, but bridges like the Mirandi Bridge are subject to constant vibration from the traffic load, they're subject to expansion and contraction from the heat and the cold, and they're also subject to corrosive damage from salty sea air and from the smoke from factory chimneys. In these situations, it's common to see cracks in the concrete, leading to the inner steel elements becoming exposed and subject to corrosion. Take a look at this photograph of another of Mirandi's bridges, and it's easy to see how this will radically shorten the lifespan of a bridge. The Genoa Bridge suffered from all the aforementioned problems, and it was apparent not long after the official opening that it would in fact require lots of maintenance. In just five short years, some of the exposed ends of the steel deck abutments had corroded completely, 
and had to be replaced with stainless steel coverings. It seems that even Miranda himself might have been having second thoughts about his design, as in a report published in 1979, he mused on the massive increase in traffic which the bridge was now handling, as well as the effects of the highly corrosive sea air combined with acidic smoke from the nearby steel mill. Both of these were degrading the bridge far more quickly than envisaged. Mirandi suggested that ongoing maintenance would be required to patch up any cracks and exposed areas using epoxy resin, and that the entire bridge should be coated with some kind of thick rubberized paint to protect it from the elements. By the early 1990s, Italy was going through a financial slump, and in an effort to raise much-needed funding, the government decided to sell off some public infrastructure. The Mirandi Bridge was one such piece of infrastructure that was sold off as part of a concession to run the country's toll roads. The winning bidder was a company owned in part by the billionaire Benetton clothing family. Now, they also happened to have a controlling interest in a company called Atlantia, which in turn owned Speyer Engineering, Speyer Engineering was the company in charge of carrying out the bridge inspections in Italy. So in effect, you ended up with a situation where the owners of the Mirandi Bridge, the, the Benettons, were also the majority shareholders in the company which inspected the bridge and gave recommendations for maintenance. A seemingly clear case of a conflict of interest, and hardly an ideal situation for the citizens of Genoa who had to cross the bridge on a daily basis. Now, some maintenance work was undertaken, as problems with corrosion on the upper part of the stairs was becoming impossible to ignore. For example, on Tower 11, it was found that around 30% of the cables had already rusted away. And during the 1990s, both Towers 10 and 11 had remedial work undertaken, with extra cables and new steel sheathing being added to try and take some of the load away from the original concrete stays. Tower 9, the one which would collapse in 2018, was left as it was. No repair work was done, and the reason for this is unclear. Instead, monitoring systems were placed on the spans, listening devices that listened to the pitch of the rusting cables within the span and hoped to pick up telltale signs of cables losing strain inside the concrete sleeves. By the 2010s, there were ever-increasing calls for the Mirandi Bridge to be replaced, or at least to undergo a full repair and strengthening procedure. Time and time again, these calls were rebuffed or dismissed. One local businessman stated publicly in 2012, When that bridge falls down in a few years, we will all remember those who said no to repairing it. Even alarming photographs showing what looked like rusty cables hanging from the crumbling bridge prompted no action. Government ministers at the time stated that the bridge would go on for another 50 years, and that speculation of its collapse was just a fairy tale. Hmm, how wrong they were. By April 2018, the company responsible for the maintenance of the bridge had finally put the contract for the repair work out to tender, but this was too little, too late. At 11.36am on August the 11th, during a violent thunderstorm, Section 9 of the Mirandi Bridge collapsed. Cars and lorries were plunged 45 metres down to the valley bottom, where most of them were then crushed by the enormous concrete tower and support trestles as they collapsed on top of the wreckage. Video footage which captured the moment of the collapse appears to show the sudden cable span going slack before coming apart, and the entire roadway then falling, followed by the massive 90 metre support tower. 43 people were killed, and many more were seriously injured. But it could have been a lot worse. Luckily it was a public holiday, most of the warehouses below the bridge were empty. Also, the modular design of the bridge meant that only Section 9 collapsed. Spans 10 and 11, which went above the houses and the tenement blocks, thankfully remained intact. In the immediate aftermath of the collapse, a 12-month state of emergency was declared in the Genoa district, and more than 600 people were evacuated from the dwellings beneath the bridge, as there was the possibility that the rest of the bridge might come down. Speculation as to the actual cause of the collapse varied from the bridge being struck by lightning during the storm, to excessive traffic, to high winds. 
Now, there was no immediate comment from the owners of the bridge, the Benetton family. Indeed, it took 48 hours for the Benetton company to release a somewhat bland statement offering their condolences to the families of those that perished. When pressed on why they'd kept quiet for 48 hours, the family patriarch, Gilberto, lamely stated that it was as a mark of respect. The Italian people were outraged. Not only had they been paying higher and higher road tolls over the years, but it looked like the Benettons had been lining their pockets with the extra profits instead of maintaining the infrastructure, as was their duty. To many people, it seemed that Benetton's image of being a compassionate and caring brand was just that, just an image. And it's an image which has been severely tarnished since the collapse of the Mirandi Bridge. The full investigation into exactly what caused the collapse of the bridge is still underway, but from what information has been made available to the public, it seems clear that poor maintenance has been identified as one of the factors at play. 59 people are currently on trial, accused of failing to adequately maintain the bridge. It turns out that inspections were often made from ground level, simply looking at the bridge through binoculars, instead of actually getting out onto the bridge and performing thorough close-up inspections. In the days before the collapse, a large crack had been reported in the roadway, and at the same time, road crews were installing heavy concrete jersey barriers onto the bridge, increasing the loading strain on the cable stays. In the end, it was just too much. The combination of a flawed initial design, coupled with decades of inadequate maintenance, and a management who prioritised profits over safety, led to the inevitable collapse of the Mirandi Bridge. And sadly, the many voices who prophesied this were proven correct. What to do with the remains of the Pulchivera viaduct was a somewhat contentious issue, as many wished to preserve the remains of the bridge for posterity, but in the end, the remaining sections of the bridge were blown up in a controlled demolition in June 2019. As a side note, Ricardo Mirandi, the original designer, died in 1989, and so never had to witness the collapse of his own showpiece bridge. There are around half a dozen Mirandi bridges that use the same type of concrete and case stays that were used in Genoa, and at least two other Mirandi bridges have had structural troubles. The Wadi El Kuf bridge in Libya and the Rafael Urdanta bridge in Venezuela have both been described as being on the verge of collapse at some point during their lifespan. So if you have a journey that takes you over an old concrete Mirandi bridge, my advice to you would be get your foot down and get to the other side as soon as possible. <laughs>